that 7% oh, of the world's population create 50% of the emissions while the poorest 50% create just 7%. Seven weeks ago today, on 15th of October, around 2,000 people met in front of St Paul's Cathedral. You may have heard of this. With the intention of occupying the heart of the financial sector, the London Stock Exchange, or the space in front of it, at least. We were prevented from doing so by the private owners of Paternoster Square, who had issued an injunction. You can say boo. Yeah. There'll be a few boos as we go along, so. So a camp of tents sprang up down one side of the cathedral. Since then, we've occupied two more sites in London, and there are dozens more around the country. And I believe there are over 2,000 occupations around the world now. This is a global, powerful global movement. The activists who've been involved in these protests know what millions who didn't or couldn't participate also know. Things cannot go on the way they are. These protesters also knew this. Change won't come about just through protests, although these are very important in raising awareness. And what's true for the economic and the financial system is also true for the environment. And I want to say to you that in fact it's the same fight. In New York recently, the Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek gave a speech in which he said, they tell you that we're dreamers, but the true dreamers are those who think that things can go on indefinitely the way they are. Yeah. Take a, a notorious example, the Koch brothers. They are the biggest funders in the United States of climate disinformation. Yeah, Having taken ExxonMobil recently according to Greenpeace US. They're the biggest funders of the Tea Party movement. Um, yeah, for people that don't know what tail sands are, basically it's bitumen in sand. And it can be down to 40, 50 metres underground. Um, so there's a massive mega project in Canada, and if we don't stop these mega projects, all the other little bits and pieces that we do will add up to nothing. The area in Canada is bigger than the UK, and at the moment they're only extracting tail sands from a small part of it. But in 2009, Canada's emissions as a result of extracting tar sands went up by 34% when we're all supposed to be cutting ours. And BP themselves admit that if we dug up, refined and burnt all the tar sands just in Canada, and there are in other places around the world, then that would equate to a 6 degree centigrade global temperature rise. And they don't seem to think that's a problem. Um, another thing that's happening is the European Union's Fuel Quality Directive where the European Union is trying to set certain values on certain types of oils according to their emissions. Tar sands being high emissions would have a higher value which would mean it's expensive which would mean if it went through it could be effectively be a ban on tar sands oil in the UK and in Europe. Um, the government have changed their position at least seven times on whether they'll support um, tar sands being given a higher value. There's new fossil fuels in this country as well, something that also started in the US um, and has now moved here. And that's hydraulic fracturing or fracking for natural gas. Um, it involves drilling a hole into the ground, into the shell rock, injecting chemicals and water at high pressure. This causes the rock to break and the natural gas to come out. Um, it has been used in the United States and it actually has caused lots and lots of problems. How many people here have watched Gasland? Yes, so some of you have seen these lovely pictures of this methane that's making its way into people's drinking water. And it gets to a point where you can actually set your tap water on fire. There's that much methane gas in it. You also have issues of the fracked fluid, which is the chemicals that they use, getting into people's drinking water. So what this results in, um, people are getting quite ill. The industry will say they can treat the water and it's fine. However, there have been instances of people making coffee from treated water. This is water that they put their own chemicals in to make it okay and safe for consumption. And these people have been hospitalized. 
We are having some victories, but overall we still need to campaign. There's an early day motion, um, EDM 2292, which Carolyn Lucas has introduced, and it actually is calling for a moratorium on this industry, on fracking, until we know more about the environmental impacts. Please, I'd, ask you to do, I'd like to ask you to do two things. One is, go to the biofuelwatch.org.uk website. That will give you information on the political, the social, the economic <laughs> facts and scientific behind the biofuel concept. Secondly, please go to the ActionAid website because there you will find dozens and dozens of videos that tell you the personal stories of the misery, suffering and death that's perpetrated by the biofuel industry on communities around the world and particularly Africa. You'll be amazed. It is truly horrific. In Africa, in Uganda, a British biofuel company called New Forests has evicted 22,000 people from their own land, fenced it off, and on the promise of jobs, promise of wells, promise of clinics, promise of schools, have actually employed a few dozen people as armed guards to keep the true owners of that land away. That's what biofuels mean to the people in the developing world. Another company I'd like to cite is Sun Biofuels, famous in Tanzania for the very same reason, forcibly evicting people off their land because of promises to the government that are never met. <laughs> right, the first one I think will probably be a cheer. Eighteen months ago the government scrapped the third runway at Heathrow. Yay! They spoke to their friend, the mayor, Mr. Johnson. And he and that famous architect who thinks he knows about the economy, Lord Foster, came up with an idea called Boris Island. Now, Boris Island would have four runways. Runways would have been the biggest single emitter of CO2 in the country. Just think what Boris Island would do. This is the fact. Only 5% of the world's population have ever flown. Okay, so things are incredibly critical in the world, but this is a really inspiring moment because the first time in my life, having been involved in many really important single issue things against war, against poverty, against climate change. There is a movement now that we need to support that is about challenging all of those things at once. Yeah. Because every one of these things, even the most cataclysmically crucial like climate change, are symptoms of the same disease. And there is no way we can deal with any one of those huge symptoms without dealing with the disease as a whole. Let's join that movement. Let's stand as part of that movement. Let's challenge the hypocrisy and the inaction. Let's challenge the idea that the market has any solutions to these problems. The market has not got solutions to these problems. But let's challenge also the false choice that there is, it is between jobs and a sustainable future. Our future lies in creating sustainable jobs that can reduce emissions. It's, it, our future lies in challenging the global economic order that puts profit before people and the planet. So few of us are impacting on so many people's lives. We have to take accountability. We have to stand up and be responsible and saying, I care about this and I want to rectify this situation in whatever way I can. And that really means really taking a hard look at our lives in terms of consumption, in terms of travel, everything. Changing our life and our lifestyle in terms of fitting in with zero carbon Britain doesn't mean that our quality of life has to be poor. It really doesn't mean that. Anyway, so I would really like you to join with me in demanding zero carbon Britain by 2030. When I say zero, oh, well, I'll just go for it, I guess. <laughs> What do we want? Yeah. When do we want it? 2030. What do 